Hello and uh, welcome to the uh, medical image analysis course. Um, this is one of the few introductory lectures about medical imaging systems um, in general, uh, where you, you will get an idea of um, what the images produced by these imaging systems actually represent. Okay. So, these are the four uh, imaging systems that we will look at um, X-ray imaging or uh, X-ray projection radiography and X-ray computer tomography. Uh, magnetic resonance imaging, ultrasound imaging systems and um, radionuclide imaging. So, um, not necessarily in this order, uh, but we will cover all these four uh, to get an understanding of what um, these the images produced by these systems actually represent, right? like I stated before. Uh, one of the things we will not do is to look deeply at the image reconstruction techniques. Okay? Uh, some of them all in fact, X-ray, computer tomography, MRI, and uh, radionuclide imaging um, all require uh, some form of uh, inversion technique to actually obtain the image. Um, so, but we will not go delve into the details of such techniques. We will just look at how the image is actually acquired and we will uh, in passing note uh, you know what the kind of formulation that is required to um, obtain the actual image from the signals that are gathered by these imaging systems. Okay. So, first we will start off with the um, radiographic imaging systems which is basically X-ray radiographs. Um, these are these must be familiar to most people at some point in your life. If you have had some form of a you know, fracture or maybe you had some chest complaints or respiratory complaints, and you would have uh, done a, a X-ray or projection radiography or chest X-ray in general, you should have some most of you would have done. Okay, so we'll start off with you know the basic uh, you know components of a radiographic imaging system. Um, also look at what is the physics behind X-ray interactions with uh, tissue and how images are acquired. Okay. So, X-ray this is one of the oldest um, um, among the oldest you know imaging system modalities. So, X-rays in general were discovered in 1895 by Rangan by experimenting with this cathode ray tubes or uh, Crookes tubes and uh, X-rays are basically nothing but X, uh, electromagnetic radiation, right. They are electromagnetic radiation, but with slightly higher energy. So, they occupy the high frequency range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. So, if you look at the EM spectrum, so which is plotted here right from the um, photon uh, you know now right here, I have indicated the type of radiation that you most of you would be familiar with and out here is the energy range. Right? Energy range is stated in electron volts, you can uh, look up and convert it into let us say joules or whatever uh, system or in fact, into wavelengths if you are comfortable with dealing with wavelengths. Right? So, um, infrared and visible you know this, these are of the order of nanometers. Right? So, as we move here to the X-ray um, range, the energy is of the order of um, you know uh, thousands of electron volts. Right? So, typically if you are near trying to look at um, the medical X-rays, right, the ones that you use for imaging, they would be of the order of tens of kilo volts. So, tens of kilo volts. Uh, for instance, you know, if you look at a X-ray computer tomography machine, you would uh, you you would have something of the order of uh, 180 to 150 kV, right? So, typical. These are some typical numbers. So, these translate to about you know 10 raised to 3 to 10 raised to 5 electron volts. This is the range in which the medical X-rays are typically used. Right? Most a lot of the X-ray applications fall in this range. So, just for reference, you know, if you're looking at you know visible light, um, that is basically WebGR, um, that that corresponds to 1 to 10 eV. Okay? So that gives you the idea of the energy differences uh, in between these two um, uh, uh, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is one of the reasons also why X-rays are uh, also kind of uh, a safety issue. Uh, issue because they are slightly higher energy, they can cause damage at the cellular level. So, there are a lot of safety uh, procedures built in place to avoid over, ex over exposure when examining a patient. Okay. So, how are these X-rays produced in a modern uh, X-ray tube which is part of a X-ray radiograph imaging system. Right. So, this is basically a vacuum tube which consists of a cathode. So, it's, it has a, so the modern X-ray tube basically consists of a cathode Meaning nothing, a filament of wire which is shown right here. I want to mess up the drawing, just there. So that cathode actually is the emitter of um, electrons. It's thermionic emission. So if you pass current through it, it heats up and it emits electrons, right? And these electrons are accelerated by a potential difference, okay, across um, across the tube and to hit something the, the anode plate or the anode target. So the anode target is typically coated with uh, tungsten or other materials with high Z materials. 
So, as the electrons uh, hit the cathode, they penetrate it and in the process they emit energy. There are emissions in several forms, we will look at those later. And that uh, the uh, sorry, the, the electrons are absorbed by the target, target anode and the process by which they are absorbed uh, results in the emission of x-rays. right? And there are two, primarily two different uh, types of x-ray emissions, one is called characteristic x-ray, the other one is called the Bremsstrahlung. We will look at this, uh, those two in detail later uh, slides. But this is the typical uh, you know construction of an x-ray tube. Of course, the modern tubes have, there are all kinds of uh, um, uh, modifications have been made to enable much more efficient imaging. So, we can, we will not discuss that too much just to understand that these, uh, this is how x-rays are produced. Of course, another point to note is that all these electrons that are emitted by the cathode, they are accelerated across a potential difference and they are focused to hit a spot on the anode target. right? And this, this actually, uh, this is important because the, the, the spot, the size of the spot has an, has an impact on the resolution of the image that is finally produced. So, in lot of the image reconstruction techniques, uh, just to mention uh, in passing here, uh, they, the, you, you would make this idealization that it is actually a point, right? the, the x-rays come from a point, that is not necessarily the case. So, in for instance, if you have a for instance a clinical x-ray tube, the spot size would be of the order of you know it is uh, 0.5 millimeter, maybe point, uh, point 0.2 to 0.5 millimeters or even larger, okay? because you can't make, if you want higher flux, you need a larger spot size. So, the, the focusing of the electrons onto a particular spot affects the resolution of the image which is finally reconstructed. Uh, but again, uh, we will not go into too much into detail here on uh, just because we have to understand where, how these uh, the images acquired, how these images are formed and also just to understand what these images represent. Right? So, this is a very slightly qualitative uh, look at these imaging systems. Okay. So, like I mentioned, there are primarily two different mechanisms. Right? So, we will go, uh, we will, we will look, we will explain this uh, graph later I will come back to this one, but we just look at you know the um, Bremsstrahlung and the characteristic radiation, they are two different um, radiation that are typically emitted. So, just to point out here anyway since we are on this slide, um, see the Bremsstrahlung radiation would be this basically these uh, continuous things, right. Yeah, so, these, these flat regions okay, and here similarly everywhere, right. So, these are the regions which come up which correspond to the Bremsstrahlung, they are the continuous uh, uh, emissions. Okay, so, just in case you are wondering what the axis are, the y axis you can treat it like um, uh, like a number. right? So, the number of uh, x-ray photons emitted and the x axis is the energy. right? So, it is basically like a histogram of the number of photons emitted in each energy range. Okay? It um, and it is it is actually you can normalize it so that the area under it is 1 etcetera, but typically that gives you like a uh, you can treat it like a probability, distrib probability distribution of the number. Uh, uh, of the probability of uh, an X-ray photon belonging to a particular energy. So each point here, again, if you look at this plot, so this is an energy, and the corresponding po point would be. How do I wipe this off? Is there a way to? Okay. So if you if you draw a straight line, yeah, this point would correspond to the number or uh, the probability of uh, finding a, uh, an X-ray. A photon with that particular energy, right? So this is more like a histogram of the counts. So if you count the number of photons according to energy, and then you plot the histogram, and this is what it would look like. And so this these continuous portions correspond to Bremsstrahlung. And if you see these peaks, these peaks are the characteristic. So why is it called characteristic? Because they are unique to every material. Okay. The material in this case we are looking at the target material. Like we saw in the previous slide, if you remember, we had a target. This is the anode target. Right. It is made of a certain material. So, for instance, I mentioned tungsten. Okay. You can coat it with other things also, high Z materials or high atomic number materials. And the X-rays emitted will have a characteristic peak that will be different from this. Right. This corresponds to, in this case, uh, molybdenum. In okay. the last one, this is the tungsten one. Okay. So, the um, there are the the process of generating these peaks as the uh, as the Bremsstrahlung is slightly different. We will briefly look at how these are produced. Okay. So, uh, these both uh, fall under both Bremsstrahlung and characteristic radiation, they fall under what is called radiative transfer. Uh, the other thing that occurs is collision transfer. So, we saw that you know in the, um, the way that X-rays are generated is that you have these electrons accelerated across a potential difference into the uh, uh, you know and to strike the target. And once that happens, see the, the radiative transfer process leads to the X-ray emission. The other process is basically the electrons just collide and come to a halt or are absorbed by the material. And uh, in that process, there is a, they, they, a lot of heat is emitted. 
okay. So, it is basically it goes away as heat right. So, the characteristic radiation happens when uh, if you are familiar with the Bohr model of the atom okay. If you are not familiar with the Bohr model of the atom you can please look it up. So, the Bohr model of the atom puts these electrons around the nucleus of an atom in K, L and M shells different shells each shell can have only a certain number of electrons. So, the characteristic radiation is produced when uh, the, inter, in the incident electron collides with the K shell electron and knocks it out right and ionizes the atom. So, the K shell is then filled with electrons from L, M or N shell okay. uh, these are high end energy shells. And so, when the, when these when this filling happens, so when K to L uh, when the L to K or M to K or N to K transitions happen, there is a uh, loss of energy which is basically in the form of a X-ray photon. Okay. So, that is the characteristic peak that you would see uh, in the spectrum, right. Um, so, the difference in the, the so the difference in the energy right from going from K, L and M shell right. So, for instance, L to K shell transition, M to K shell transition or N to K shell transition, it is unique for different elements. Okay. So, that is why these peaks are also characteristic of the atoms involved which is basically the atoms of the target. Okay. So, hence the name characteristic radiation or characteristic peaks which you will find in the X-ray spectrum that I showed earlier. Okay. Okay. So, the second uh, uh, dominant uh, contribution or the most dominant contribution um, to the X-ray spectrum is basically the so called uh, breaking radiation this is a German word for breaking. So, the interaction which is basically the interaction of electrons with the nucleus of the atom. Okay. So, how does it interact because as the electron approaches the nucleus of the atom, nucleus of the atom is positively charged right it has protons in it. So, it will slow down the electron. So, it is it's something like a you know a satellite around a planet right. So, it, it actually slows down the electron as it approaches the nucleus because it pulls it in whichever trajectory it is in it pulls it towards the nucleus right. Um, there could be some collisions might can happen right because but then these are rare right. Uh, but most electrons what happens it slows them down. But then and, and they do move away from the atom, but with lower energy right. So, when the, but there, there are theories and of course, experimentation uh, also show that when a charged particle is decelerated or accelerated, then there is loss of energy in the form of radiation, which is what we observe with the rest of the spectrum. So, the continuous parts of the spectrum fall under this principle of breaking, breaking radiation, which is emitted when the uh, electrons that are striking the target are slowed down by the nuclei of the uh, target atoms okay, because they are positively charged they will tend to slow them down and change their trajectory. So, slow down also means not necessarily you know they basically accelerating. So, you either um, you know um, pull them away from the original trajectory a trajectory which leads to uh, this emission of characteristic radiation. So, um, <coughs> another point to note is that you know um, again when you go back to the uh, to the spectrum here um, one of the things you have to note you see is that you know the spectrum is a function of energy right you see that is that is why it is called spectrum. So, whatever comes out from a typical x-ray tube has an entire range of energies it is just not monochromatic. Um, so, typically but when you do a lot of the analysis or when you actually try to do reconstruction etcetera you would actually end up assuming like an average energy or you know if it is just a you know, mono energetic beam you know things of that sort. So, but uh, that is not entirely true. So, you will have this range of energies and this range is determined by the accelerating potential. So, we saw that you know as the electron is um, uh, by thermionic emission uh, electrons are emitted from the uh, cathode, but they are accelerated by a potential difference right. That potential difference usually stated as kvp uh, is what determines the maximum energy of the electron. Okay, and that determines the maximum energy in the spectrum also. Okay, so, we will move on to you know um, what exactly like I said we, our idea is to understand what exactly is being uh, imaged when we do radiography right. So, what its images what, what, what it what these images represent at least in the, well for CT this is strictly true, but for uh, radiographs this is basically the summation over these uh, so called attenuation coefficients. So, these are called this mu is called an attenuation coefficient, it is called a linear attenuation coefficient I will not sense of ok, linear attenuation coefficient. So, it has um, inverse length that is the units. So, let us say it is usually in the form of centimeter minus 1 typically or millimeter sterilized. So, um, so, so, what 
um, uh, you have to understand is how do we you know how do we, how do we perceive the human body or whatever tissue in terms of mu okay so mu is a function is a very complex function and it's a function of energy one so mu is a function of energy energy of the x-ray photon okay it's also a function of uh, of the atomic number right and so depending on energy you will have yes okay so mu is a function of the energy as well as the atomic number okay so again it depends it is a very complex function of that and so and, and, and of course th this shows that you know it is a material property it is the atomic number is that so it is a material property and uh, it, the, uh, the interaction between x-rays and materials whether it be human tissue or any other material is determined by this mu okay so the simple relation that uh, typically is used um, to model this uh, interaction between uh, x-rays and material is if you have let us say an incident beam of photon x-ray photons i 0 is its intensity okay and through a slab of material uh, which of in of characterized by mu okay and of course it is it is at d centimeters thick and if you measure the exiting intensity of the exit intensity of the uh, x-ray photons then you can write down the following relationship right uh, in this case x i have used x sorry it should be uh, d okay okay now it is this is true only if uh, this is a homogeneous object right let us say you know just to, it can consist of only one type of atom nothing else right but a human body is not strictly not true or generally most materials it is not true so mu is basically then a function of right or you can say in, in general any vector we can just say it is a function of x it is a vector right so uh, mu, mu is will change from location to location right so then we can then write this relationship as uh, So, this is typical, but then there is one more thing that we uh, we are one other assumption that you are making here. We are assuming that it is I naught and it is all at the same energy, some E naught, right. That is also not true. If you have a real source, then which means that if you want to actually count the number that comes out, then we just have to integrate it over the spectrum. We denote the spectrum by S of E prime, right. E is to minus integral, then this is a function of E prime, right? And then we have to integrate over all energies. Okay, this will give you the number. Okay. So this this is the relationship that is typically used for all X-ray imaging modalities. For it for the case of radiographs, what we get is a super. Now we know that for a radiograph, when we do a measurement, we just let's say um, a measure uh, I then i is a superposition of all mu's right you can see, see that i is a superposition of all mu's because the way to look at it is if you take the negative log just minus mu d or in this case if you just uh, use this formula then it is just my mu dx integral mu dx which means it is a linear superposition so that is why you know for an x-ray radiograph all these structures in the human body are superimposed so that tells you why this is like a shadow think of it like a shadow which you get with an x-ray okay again many of these properties are dependent on energy so there is a certain energy range in which you know we get very good contrast if you could very put very high energy there is very good chance of you know, of course uh, radiation damage uh, and also that you know sometimes you know our body will be transparent to some of these energies most of these photons will go through without interaction and then you won't get any information okay okay so then what is this mu where does this mu come from right we looked at this mu mu is the linear attenuation coefficient where does this come from okay, that's a question where is uh, what is the origin of mu the, or the new mu originates from two interactions primarily especially in the context of uh, medical imaging x-rays or x-rays for medical use uh, two um, things that um, two interactions that lead to this uh, uh, attenuation. So, one is called Campton's, Compton scattering, right. So, um, okay, before you go into that, if you understand that mu is, is some, some, uh, some way to describe how 
the X-ray photons are absorbed or scattered within the human body. That's all. It just represents a model for scattering. It's a mathematical model for how your measurements. We are firing some uh, X-ray photons through some tissue, we are measuring the exit, and you want to know what happened in between. And this mu helps you just give up a form a model. But on the physics basis is what I'm going to look at. Okay. The content scattering has uh, actually a bad impact on image quality. Um, so what it does is basically it's, it's uh, the the uh, the incident X-ray photons interact with the outermost orbital, outermost shell electrons, okay. and that interaction leads to a deflection of the X-ray photons from its initial path. So instead of going through a straight line, it just gets deflected. Again, remember these are all kind of stochastic in nature in the sense you know it's not like you're following one one photon at a time. So think of it in an average, millions of photons are coming through in a packet. Some fraction of it will be deflected by this interaction. So that's what you lead to loss of contrast. The photoelectric absorption. This is actually a desirable impact because this uh, this actually gives you a very good um, um, high quality image because the content scattering because it's deflected it will go and hit the detector at some other location if you're looking at 2D imaging and that causes uh, you know loss of contrast. Here here what happens is that the the incident radiation at k edge energies we saw that right like for instance for a generation of X-rays also we saw that the same way. If the incident X-ray, uh, the um, diagnostic X-ray, is has the is higher than the K edge of some of the materials in the body, in a human body, then it is absorbed, leading to excitation of electrons. So the photon is completely absorbed. X-ray photon is completely, completely, completely absorbed, and um, and again this depends strongly on atomic number, um, and it diminishes with uh, increase in photon energy. Okay, so there is an actual relationship. I I, I don't have the numbers with me at now, but. Uh, Content scattering is very constant. Uh, is is uh, it? What can I say? It's um, it's a function of uh, electron density, which is basically the atomic number. So it's linearly on electron density, but over all energies, it's constant. Okay. At higher energies, for a very high energies, photon photoelectric absorption doesn't happen. So there's just the the photon just goes through. Okay. There are two other uh, uh, interactions which are um, uh, which are also occur, but are very not very important for. X-ray image generation, which is Rayleigh scattering and pair production. Okay. okay, so we'll just now briefly look through some of the X-ray detectors or for projection radiography. Okay, um, we will just look at maybe two of them. I have given some notes about the other two. Uh, welcome to look through those. So the one that is um, used that you most of you would have seen, um, is either the storage phosphors or uh, or some kind of a screen uh, film combination. So basically, what happens is you have a film, okay, which is light sensitive film, which is sandwiched between two scintillators, or these are two phosphors or two scintillators, right? So what happens is when uh, a scintillator is something that converts your X-ray energy into light. So, so that's why you've seen a cassette. If you go to done, if you've done any imaging, you see they'll have a cassette kind of thing, uh, like a large plate. We'll have this film in sandwich between two layers of for, um, uh, scintillators. You can call it that, or phosphors, as they are called. So when the light is, when the X-rays is incident on the uh, on the on the scintillators or phosphors, then they are converted into light and they expose the film. Okay. So this film again, um, it can be of two types. One is they are instantly exposed, and you can uh, then digitize them. Okay. That's one way. The other one is called the photostimulable phosphors, wherein, you know, once it's exposed, it, the the, uh, the uh, uh, image is stored latently. So then you have to again, once again, excite them with laser, and record the image as it appears. So and basically, when you stimulate them again with lasers, then there's some more emission of light, which you can record and digitize. Okay. So these are called PSPs, and uh, there here it allows for easy digitization. Okay. The last one that is the most fast-growing. Uh, uh, Market is the flat panel detectors, right? These are basically uh, digital, uh, fully digital systems where the detector is basically like uh, has sensors which will directly convert your X-rays into a, a digital array of images. Okay, this could be uh, charge coupled device cameras, thin film transistor, or CMOS. CMOS is something that you see in your smartphone cameras, except that the CMOS will be coated with the scintillator material. So when the X-rays hit the scintillators, they emit light, and the CMOS array actually records that signal. Okay. So there are again there's, uh, there are um, other uh, ways of detecting X-rays, but these are the most common ways, and people still use these uh, techniques, right? Okay. 
So, here are some uh, representative chest x ray images uh, taken from different publications, these are open access databases. So, this is what typical x ray images look like, you might have seen some of them, but these are all chest x rays. The top row um, is basically from a database called Chex, but I have not indicated what disease conditions they might have. Uh, they, th this database has a large collection of x rays with normal patients and patients with different kinds of respiratory problems or lung related diseases. The, um, the bottom row of images can correspond to people uh, who have COVID, again this is once again from a publicly uh, from an open access journal paper, I have cited it below. Again it shows patient, different patients who have uh, COVID conditions, again uh, none of their identities are here, it just show a representative uh, selection of images um, that you get from a, a projection radiography. Okay. Um, so, we, we will now move on to x-ray CT or computer tomography, once again, um, again a most uh, commonly used diagnostic imaging system, one of the most commonly, of course, x-ray uh, projection radiography is some like the uh, most common uh, diagnostic scan that is done all over the world, that is that's the most common thing, right, people use it all the time. Um, and this is again a very fast um, growing imaging uh, modality in the sense of in the number of patients referred, etcetera. So, um, <coughs> This once again, this the difference between this and what we saw for project, uh, projection radiography is that this produces cross sectional images of the body, right. So, we saw that when you did projection radiography, you have a superposition of the anatomical structures, primarily if you look at the imaging equation, you will see that. But here with this, we are able to get cross section. It is like if you have a patient lying down on the bed on a uh, and if you can slice the patient. Right, and let us say the, uh, the uh, length of the patient is z axis, you can cut planes perpendicular to the z axis and you can look at them. Right. So, that, that, that those kind of images are produced uh, by the uh, x-ray computer tomography scanner. Here once again, uh, the, the images that are acquired, the signal that is acquired can still be considered projection. So, what is unique is that there is the inversion process, basically a mathematical technique called back projection or filtered back projection, there are other techniques also which uh, take these projections and process them into a cross sectional image or stacks of cross sectional images, which will give you like a volumetric um, uh, image of the entire body. Okay. So, here is the process. So, it is the same the uh, many of the I mean the system is the same as what we saw for a um, x-ray projector. The x-ray tubes used in um, uh, computer tomography and the x-ray detectors used in computer tomography are uh, different from those in the sense that you know they uh, these principles are the same but you know they have different slightly different materials and the x-ray tubes in a computer tomography scanner are slightly more higher energy ratings and have to be more robust because they are on, on continuously and they are pulsed. Okay. So, that is a difference, we will not go in again go into details, but then you know the principle of x-ray generation remains the same no matter what kind of tube is there, uh, similar to again same thing for applies for the x-ray detection. Okay. So, using um, thin x-ray beam lines, right. So, uh, we do not, we do not see if you just look at the x-rays that come out of a x-ray tube, there is usually an exit window, it come out as a like a cone. Okay. So, you can use the entire cone to actually capture images, okay. but typically there is a collimation which occurs only a fan which captures the image. Okay. And using these thin x-ray beam lines, projections are mature. So, projection measurement is the same as what we saw for uh, projection radiography, the same principle, but then you take the projections from different angles. So, let us say if you are done a chest x-ray before, you typically are required to stand in front of the um, uh, detector, but instead think of you on a rotating table, of yourself on a rotating table and then every time you rotate by let us say half a degree, there is a uh, projection image taken. Okay. So, that is the typical uh, uh, image acquisition process here. We will, I will show you some images, at least an image which will tell you how, uh, give you some indication how it is done. So, before this computer tomography came about, there are other efforts also to acquire um, cross sections, right, rather than just the projection and they were effort, they are known as axial tomography and linear tomography. I will not discuss them just to, uh, just some historical perspective, right. Okay. So, X-ray CT detectors once again, we will just go through them quickly. This is again X scintillator crystals with photodiodes, photodiode array. Okay. The scintillator once again is a material which converts X-rays into visible light. Photodiode receives the visible light to produce an electric current, which is what is recorded as your signal. Okay. Um, and the scintillators are designed to have very high efficiency in the sense they will capture most of the X-ray photons that hit them and convert them into a light 
which are then measured by the photodiode. Okay. Um, so, once again this the circuitry connected related to all this is, um, is again slightly complicated because uh, this acquisition has to be done uh, very fast. Okay. So, they have very high end analog to digital converters etcetera which can um, digitize these signals very rapidly. Okay. There are other types of uh, detectors also which are now becoming um, more common and of course, it is soon in the future that will they, they will replace hope to replace the existing systems. These are called photon counting detectors. So, on the these recent um, technological progress is basically when you are able to uh, count photons based on their energy. So, typically most of the um, or all of the um, X-ray CT detectors are called energy integrating detectors. You cannot differentiate the energy of the X-ray photon that hits it. So, basically it, it will hit the scintillator and you will get a bunch of light photons which you will just uh, which the photodiode will integrate. Right? So, there is no idea of what was the energy of the incident photon X-ray photon. So, now there is a way, a way to uh, um, uh, know the energy of the incident X-ray photon. And the uh, those detectors use uh, some materials like cadmium telluride and cadmium zinc telluride, which helps them to threshold and count. Yes. Um, so um, again, uh, these these detectors help. So why why does it help to have uh, energy discriminating detectors in this case as or photon counting detectors? Because we saw that the attenuation coefficient is a function of energy. Okay. So if we can reconstruct images based on photon counts, uh, x-ray x photon counts obtained at different energies, we can get different kinds of contrast. By contrast what we mean is differentiation between different types of tissue, okay. much much better because most of the human body is water. And if you saw that mu the attenuation coefficient whose which is what is um, uh, responsible for the you know which de 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 describes the x-ray interaction with, uh, with tissue, you know if it is mostly water then it is not too much of a difference, okay, density difference. So, the mu is not too different except again maybe bones, right. You can see that bones are very clearly shown in projection and radiographs also because they are much higher atomic number. But so, this kind of detectors help you to uh, get better contrast. So, you can reconstruct at multiple energies and try to figure out uh, you know uh, uh, different types of tissue like maybe cancers become very obvious um, early on if you use this kind of image. But again this is work in progress, right. Okay, so, just wanted to promise there are some pictures I wanted to show you. I hope the contrast is good. So, this is a cross section of uh, X ray CT machine that has been opened up, right. So, this whole donut like hole you see is where the patient bed goes in, the patient lying on the bed and the bed goes in through there. You see this piece, this T is the this, uh, yeah, so I do not know whether this color is visible, but yeah, that is your X ray tube, it is slightly bigger than that. And this is the detector array, I do not know if you see it. So, detector array okay. and this other red marks just show uh, you know the path of a x ray from the x ray tube to the detector array. So, those are the lines that we were talking about uh, that they that you would measure, these are the lines that you would measure. Okay. There are different ways of doing this measurement, this projection measurement, especially for x ray computer tomography, something called parallel beam, um, fan beam, and cone beam measurements. There are different scanning configurations, right. These are scanning configurations to obtain projection measurements. Okay, then we will have to again process those projection measurements to get your final image. To, so, what are these um, um, I uh, before I go any further these are actually these pictures are taken um, from a text uh, by um, Vinash Kak and Slani. So, I will just mention that here. So, here we have like I said what is what do I mean by uh, parallel projections and uh, what do you mean by fan beam projections, right. So, that is what uh, we are looking at. So, parallel beams uh, projection is it was one of the earlier uh, innovations and so sort I of not used anymore. So, we will just focus on the uh, fan beam. So, what it does is so we saw that how we can treat the source of x ray as a point that is what it is here. So, this is the position of the x ray and it emanates a beam a fan beam and when the cone of x rays are come out. So, you have co collimated to like a thin fan and this other outline here, if you can see it, that is let us say the human body or the object that you are trying to image. You have to make sure that the x ray beam covers the entire object. This right here represents a representation of the detector array. So, you have a bunch of detectors here, you can think of each of these as some kind of a cell, right, that, that measures, that counts or measures, integrates the. Um, 
um, X-ray beam that hits them, right? So this is how you collect, collect lines of data. Right? So this entire measurement. So if you can plot it, plot the intensity of the measured X-ray, right, as a function of position along this detector array. This T is the position along the detector array, and you get this plot. So this is called a projection, okay? And you can do this by rotating your X-ray beam and detector configuration around the patient and for every angle theta with respect to the axis, let us say the X axis, you can co collect this projection measurements um, and if you, if you stack them all up as a function of theta, let us say one theta below the other, then you get a 2D image, you call that a sinogram, right? Collection of all the projections acquired at different angles. And so, its sinogram is basically you can think of it as a function of theta and t. t is the distance along the detector array, theta is the angle which you move. So, every angle, yes. Yeah, this you will get to reconstruction, yes, next step. Okay, so um, just to um, understand a little bit better, just this is a better picture of what you are looking at. So, what is here is a representation of a the human torso somewhere near the thorax or chest, right? You can see that this is like the spine, you can see some lungs, etc. So, what we have to look at is just to understand physically that if you are when you are looking at an X-ray beam, you have to think of it as having a finite dimension because the detector has a finite dimension, the detector cells have a finite dimension. So, if you have an X-ray beam with uh, let us say uh, n in this case, um, n in is the number of uh, photons. incident on the patient, right? As if before you enter, that is if you count it, that is a number. And then of course, it passes through the body, let us say this is the length it travels through the body, right? It is written here, right there, right? So, and of course, this is the ray, that is that is basically the ray path, that is what is given here. So, this S, the length, S is the length of the ray path or it defines the vector that defines the ray path. So, you can always rotate your coordinate system so that x, y is, is along, in this case y is along the ray path, that is not too hard to do. So, you can always do that. And all you have to do is integrate along that. So, your signal that you get at this one detector element is nothing but what is given in there is mu of x comma y, because that is in the plane along that path, so ds, okay. And that measurement that you get is basically log, this is equal to log of n in by what is measured at the detector n d. Because we saw that, remember, if you I wrote it with i, but typically the relationship would be n uh, that the detector is n in exponential of minus integral mu ds, right? Um, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So then, if you do the uh, math, it should be easier. To, from here, you can get here. Okay. So what uh, people uh, do before reconstruction, we are not going to talk about the reconstruction itself, is that they do the log of the measurements. So, you need to have a reference detector where you measure the unattenuated beam. So, there will be one which you measure without anything in the field of view you can measure and you can use that to construct this. Okay. In case if you do not know what, what is you know because n in we do not know right because it is always attenuated beam that we measure. But you can always do a measurement a priori or have one or two detector cells outside of the field of view so that you can get that number. Okay. So, this is how projections are measured. I showed this because this is how projections are measured in a CT system slightly different from what you would describe because if you go back to that picture I showed you, so if you look this is a bank of detectors um, right here in the yellow, right. And so it extends, so it has an x, y area, right and it extends along the z axis, okay. So it is these are finite sized detectors, so they will catch a very small volume of the electron of the x-ray photon beam that you are getting. Unlike the, and this is on a curved, uh, on the circumference of a rotating gantry, these are curved arrays. You can also have a flat array also and then the reconstruction algorithm is slightly different. So, once you have these projections at different angles, so typically you would acquire slightly more than 180 degrees, okay. And um, de depending on whether you are doing parallel beam, parallel beam acquisition, you can only need to do 0 to 180 degrees because you see that after that it is redundant, 180 is the same as 0. For, for this uh, fan beam, you have to acquire slightly more than that. Um, but once they are acquired and you have this sinogram data, which is basically your uh, projection as a function of uh, your scan angle, 
or projection angle. Um, they are used re typically reconstructed using filtered back projection or there are many other techniques like iterative reconstruction techniques, there are some deep learning based techniques also which are done. And the CT image intensity is uh, after reconstruction you get a CT image intensity which is referred to as, uh, as the Hounds field unit. So, it is typically it is HU. Okay. So, so, how do you reconstruct? So, very quickly again I am not going to walk through the specifics, very simple way of looking at it is you take, um, so this is the projection, so this is the projection data right, right there. So, let us check you take a point in the projection right, some value it has this is some, p, some in this case this is indicated by q theta i is the angle f t all my theta and q look the same apologies. Uh, so, um, so, you take this point. Um, um, but I will do the pre processing later, I will just tell you how the reconstruction is done. Then you construct the grid. So, this this red box you see here is the um, image array or grid that you define, it is a digital array that you define. And what you do is you would take this point and smear it across the grid. What do you mean by smearing it across the grid is that you know if you just for the sake of this uh, particular uh, argument, so there will be different image pixels at every point, right. So, this line will go through different image pixel that you are trying to reconstruct. So, wherever it cuts through an image pixel you will assign the same value q, q theta i of t to that particular image pixel. So, you can do that from every angle and sum them all up. This q theta i t actually is called the filtered projection. So, what you will take is you will take the raw projection which is your log data right, you have taken this log n d over n in if you remember from the previous slide right. And uh, you, you would filter this there are some many different types of filters basically to remove the high frequency noise as or um, you know uh, some of these uh, <coughs> spurious noises which can come and as well as you know this filtering is essential because you are adding over all the projection. So, you need to uh, that also helps this filtering helps. So, I it actually comes out of the derivation, but I would not go through that, but you have to take the raw projection which is this log data and you have to filter it, it is a digital filter. So, you use a fast Fourier transform filter and then take that filtered projection and back project. So, this is a typical algorithm. So, most almost any uh, maybe except for the deep learning techniques pretty much every method will have this step somewhere, where you have to by doing this smearing or back projection. Okay. So, once you do this or after you reconstructed over all the angle, you do that for every angle, for every point on the projection, every angle. Once you have done this, then what you have, what are you reconstructing? You are like reconstructing the mu, the map of mu for your view for a certain cross section. So, to normalize it, to make it into C t, you would uh, you whatever you reconstruct new reconstructed I call it recon minus mu water, this number you would get for an average energy, because remember mu all mu's are functions of energy divided by or mu r and this is typically 0, but you will do that and you multiply that by 1000. This is what you call Hounds field units. So, typically this number goes from minus 1000 to 3095, okay, you typically add a offset of 1000. So, it will go from 0 to 4095, if you recall this is basically a 12 bit number. So, all the outputs from a CT scanner are 12 bits, but the value. So, the are this difference why I spend some time here is because unlike the other two uh, that we are going to talk about MR, we are going to talk about ultrasound. So, when you talk about radionuclear imaging, radionuclear again there is some meaning, but for MR and ultrasound there is only relative contrast that is different. Here the absolute values actually have some meaning. So, if you scan somebody um, for instance, let us say you not for somebody, let us say you take a uh, uh, what is called a phantom, these are objects that you create to uh, scan in a CT scanner, you have like a glass of water, so plastic bag you scan it in a scanner here go to some other area, some other scan center and scan it, the values, the pixel values you will get will oscillate around 0, so that is that is mu water right or 100 in this case if there is noise it will be between 0 and 100. So, that value is fixed, so it is an indication of mu, it is an average mu because your X-ray spectrum is polychromatic. If you get, if you have a monochromatic spectrum then you will get an exact value every time, you should ideally get. So, within the limits of noise this mu is should be same different for different scanners. Typically, bone gets a very high number, it will be more than 2000 or something typically. So, that again you can always reliably say anything in that area region is a very high density or a high Z material. Okay. 
Okay, these are some of the typical X-ray CT images. I have again uh, given the source, the Radiopedia, and um, I won't go again. Uh, I'm not a personal expert in anatomy, but still, you know, this is the brain image. Okay, these two are images of the heart after interaction of so-called contrast agent. So typically, for some of the scans, you would inject iodine, the high Z material, high atomic number material, which will preferably absorb X-rays. So anything that will absorbs more X-rays will show up as very bright in a X-ray CT scan. Will have higher pixel value, which means that it corresponds to higher attenuation coefficient. So that will be shown there. So. Um, there are other uh, sections of images. Um, so yes, so here yes, these are the typical uh, X-ray uh, CT images. Um, again, uh, one of the skull um, or the head, I should say, and two from the uh, heart. Um, so this just gives you an idea of what kind of contrast you should expect. Like I said, the the Hounsville units are restricted to a range uh, minus thousand to three thousand ninety five or zero to four thousand ninety five. Uh, typically 12 bit images like I mentioned and uh, the, these are gray scale images, there are no channels etcetera like you would see for instance when you are using a camera or some other imaging systems. right? So this concludes our uh, description of X-ray radiography as well as um, you know X-ray computer tomography. The idea was to give you an idea of what uh, you know what is involved in the image acquisition, what exactly we are imaging and what is the images represent. You know we saw that for the case of a projection radiograph what we saw was a superposition of anatomies because we are summing through the uh, attenuation co uh, coefficients through the body. For CT images, they are just a cross sectional maps of the X-ray attenuation coefficient which are obtained from a reconstruction algorithm. We did not go through the algorithm, but just gave you a, a general idea of what is done. Okay. So we will move on to um, other imaging systems in the next class, um, hope to complete them and so that you know you get an idea of what each of these imaging modalities offer. Thank you.